Hello, everyone. As you have now heard, my name is Caleb, and most of you know me by Boydston. Now, there is a couple reasons I chose to go by this name, or I, why I tried to go by the last name, Boydston. Well, the first off is, at one point, there was 25 Caleb's coming to the school at the same time, <laughs> and four of us were on the same floor. So, practically, it was just much more convenient to just ignore Caleb and go by my last name, Boydston. However, the more important reason that I wanted to go by Boydston was because that's what my brother went by when he came here. And when I came to Ozark, my brother had built up an image for himself that was pretty well respected. From what I knew of what the Boydston image was, it was hardworking, loyal, uh, consistent, and he was a passionate leader. He also had the annoying ability to be good at almost anything he tried, and he was an insane ultimate player. And so when I came to Ozark, these are the things that I thought of myself that I wanted to be when I came to Ozark, because I was like, that's an awesome image. People respected my brother, and I wanted to be respected in that same manner. And so I came to Ozark, and I felt this responsibility to carry the Boydston image. This idea, this idea of image, however, is like, it's a complex thought. Like, when you think of image, the first thing that kind of comes to your mind is like a picture, right? If you think of a picture, is it image, picture, got it? <laughs> Perfect. So, um, a picture is a physical representation of the original. If you look at a picture, if I take a picture of, let's say we take a picture of Josh Greger, okay? Just hypothetical. We take a picture of Josh Greger, and over here, the picture shows a very handsome man, chiseled, great jawline, tan, and you're just like, oh, he's got a smile that could charm the grumpiest Cubs fan. <laughs> or, over here, you have a picture of Josh Greger, and it's, a, it's bald, he's got a gnarly beard that hasn't been touched in months, and he's got dirt just like stuck in his teeth. Which of these, which of these pictures, we've got handsome, dirt mouth, <laughs> Which of these do you think is an actual picture, an actual image of Josh Greger? I think that most of us would say that Josh is probably the one on the left, but what that, what that idea captures is that an image is really dependent upon the original for its meaning. See, if, if Josh, if there was no Josh Greger, there would no be picture of Josh Greger. What does this have to do with anything? What does it have to do with idolatry and divinity? Well, in Genesis 1, God says, let us make man in our own image. And this idea of image, what, what does it mean to be made in God's image, has been heavily debated, and I could spend hours talking about this. But what I really want to capture from this idea of image is that, is, that the image is dependent upon the original for its meaning. But there's something else about an image. If you look at an image and a physical representation of something, you don't just see the physical representation. You don't just see Joshua Greger, or you don't just see your wife, or you don't just see just the picture. You see more in it. There's more to it in an image. But you only see what you know. If, you were, if I were shown a picture of Josh Greger, let's say hypothetically, hypothetically, if Josh Greger and I were like best friends, we're roommates for a time, and uh, we did lots of cool things together. We had really hard conversations, and we're just great pals, hypothetically, of course. <laughs> and I were shown a picture of him. To me, when I see a picture of Josh Greger, I would think, hypothetically, of course, he's a great man, uh, and he loves God, and he wants to do what is right in his life, and he pushes me to do the same thing and he is a man that I will miss deeply when he goes off to China. Hypothetically, of course. <laughs> now, if I showed that same picture of Josh Greger to Jimmy Fallon, Jimmy Fallon's gonna say, guy's got a great smile. But he won't know what I'm, he won't know Josh Greger from that image like I do. And that's, that's what I wanna get at today, is that when we look at being made in God's image, we have to know God in order to know what that means. So how does this apply to us? Well, if an image is best when it's most like 
the original, so Handsome Josh or Dirt Mouth, we, we know that if we are to be an image of God, therefore we need to be most like the original. Seems like a simple concept. Is, anyone, is everyone tracking with me so far? Okay. Simple concept, right? I bet, I bet Adam and Eve thought this was a simple concept as well, you know? God created them in his image, put them in the garden, said, rule over the earth, don't eat that fruit. Pretty simple, right? I mean, ruling over the earth may have been a task, but not eating the fruit, pretty simple, easy peasy, lemon squeezy. But then comes Genesis 3, and Adam and Eve are presented with a choice. And God's good creation hangs on the balance that Adam and Eve are faced with in Genesis 3. See, Satan comes to Adam and Eve and he says, did God say that you cannot eat of any fruit in the garden? No, of course not. He said that we could eat of the trees in the garden, but of the tree in the midst of the garden, we could not eat. Okay. Then Satan throws a little sales pitch in, and he says, so I know what God said, but God knows that you will surely not die. But instead, when you eat of the tree, you will become like God, knowing good and evil. And in that moment, Satan took God's creation, God's good creation, something that we are told in scripture points to who God is and shows us his invisible attributes, and Satan used it as a mirror instead of a window. What I mean by that is that Satan took the fruit and showed Eve who she could be because of the fruit and not who God was. See, all of creation was to point to who God was so that we, as God's image, could know who he is so we could be more like him. But Satan flipped it, flipped it, and he said, no, this, this is God's creation. This is who you can be like. This creation, this creation can make you something more. This is the heart of idolatry. Taking God's creation, taking God's creation and, and seeing it as what can make us greater. It's putting his meaning, the meaning that he gives us, and finding it in something else. When Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, they set a trend for the rest of humanity. And man's search to replace God and his promise has never ended. Andrew Wilson, uh, a preacher over in England, says that the first commandment is the heart of all the rest. If you break the first commandment, or if you break any of the commandments, you break the first. Because the first is, you shall have no other God before me. In, in Romans 1, Paul, Paul goes and breaks up on this idea. And he says that all idolatry, <laughs> he talks about when Adam and Eve exchanged the truth of God for a lie. We were made in God's image. We were made to reflect him. And in Romans 1, Paul says that the effects of this was they exchanged the glory of God for a lie and worship and served the creature rather than the creator. And that is what idolatry does. And yet, when we as people try to find our meaning and our hope in life, when we try to find what we are supposed to be, who we're supposed to be like, where we want to go in life, and we look into creation, we find that Satan's advertisement, Satan's lie to Adam and Eve was a false one, it's false advertisement that leaves us wanting and searching for more. But people want to deny the idea that they're in need of something more. Yet non-Christian writer David Wallace, in a commencement speech he gave in 2005, said this. In the day-to-day -day trenches of adult life, there's actually no such thing as atheism. There is no such thing as not worshiping. Everybody worships. The only choice we get is what to worship, and an outstanding reason for choosing some sort of God or spiritual thing 
to worship, being it Jesus Christ or Allah, be it Yahweh or the wicked mother goddess or the four noble truth or some infrangible set of ethical principles, is that pretty much anything else you worship will eat you alive. If you worship money and things, if they are where you tap real meaning in life, then you will never have enough. Never feel you have enough. It's the truth. Time and age start showing you will die a million deaths before they finally plant you. Worship power, you will feel weak and afraid, and you will need ever more power over others to keep the fear at bay. Worship your intellect, being seen as smart, you will end up feeling stupid, a fraud, always on the verge of being found out. See, Wallace was able to see that the best things that this world has to offer will leave a man wanting. He uses the term worship in, in his speech to mean where one finds meaning. And as I was saying earlier, if one finds meaning in all the things that he listed above, you will come up wanting. But why is that? Well, it's because we're made in the image of God, right? As Josh Greger, a picture of Josh Greger finds its meaning only from the original. And so do we. Adam and Eve looked at the fruit and they found something different, something different than the truth God had gave them. And we know that an image is the best when it is closest to the original. We all hate blurry pictures, right? No one likes out of focus pictures. We wanna be able to see what the original is. And Adam and Eve, when they looked at the fruit and declared that, that this is what they wanted, that they would put their trust in the fruit, that the fruit would make them like God and not God who would make them like God, they, they distorted the reality of humanity and they made our picture blurry. They made the picture for the rest of humanity blurry so that when we look at man, we can't clearly see the original. We can't clearly see God anymore. Romans 1, 28 through 32 gives a long list of things that people become when they turn away from God. When people exchange the glory of God for creation. It says that they become evil, they become idolaters, they become adulterers, they become covetous and malicious. All these things that we despise or we do not hold in high respect, the things that Satan said would be great, you will become like God, turned out to come up short, not to be what we were advertised. So what do we do? We know that we're supposed to look like God. We wanna be an image, we wanna be the best image we can be so that we can know what the original looks like. But all of our examples since Adam and Eve have been distorted and we are struggling to see who God is in this reality. Well luckily, uh, God decided to step in and he sent his son, his son Jesus Christ. Colossians 1, 15 says, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. If you recall in Genesis 1, we are made in the image of God, and Colossians 1, 15 tells us that Jesus is the image of him. John 10, 30 says, I and the Father are one. That's Jesus speaking about himself, of course. And then in John 14, 9, when Philip asked Jesus to show him who the Father is, he's like, do you not know who I am? If you have seen me, you have seen the Father. So, we're Christians, we're searching for meaning, we're searching for who we are to be. We want to be as close to the original as possible, but all of our examples are distorted, except for one, and that is Jesus Christ. And Jesus is all about clarity. Jesus is all about redefining things back to the original de definition. He redefined the Messiah to be what the Messiah was the whole time. He redefined what the old, who the Old Testament was pointing to to point to who the Old Testament was pointing to the whole time because, because man has distorted what they were expecting. He clarified that the heart of the issue of sin was the heart and he redefined humanity from distorted, 
blurry, corrupted, back to the image of God. And it is only through following Jesus that we can become like the image of God once again. It is only through believing in him and our faith in him and having our belief in Jesus Christ that we can find who we are in Jesus. 1 Corinthians 11.1, 1, Paul says, be imitators of me as I am of Christ. See, when I came to Ozark, my, the image that I was trying to follow was, one of my, was my brother's. I wanted to follow my brother's footsteps and develop the Boydston image. And luckily for me, my brother was pursuing Christ and he was trying to be an imitator of Christ. So as I went through this stage of unknowingly following someone, I was being drawn closer to Christ. But it was unconscious. I was unconscious of what I was doing. I just wanted to be like my brother. And unfortunately, a lot of people are going to try to tell you what to do. Try to tell you who you want to be like. If you go anywhere into the world when you leave this place, before you leave this place, you're gonna be thrown images of people trying to tell you what to do, what it means to be fully alive, what it means to be human. And it's a distorted reality that they're going to try to tell you and just confuse you and tell you that there's meaning in money and there's meaning in power and there's meaning in all of these other things, things that both Paul and David Wallace seem to understand that they don't have anything to offer you. Not, not really. My sermon is titled, Leaving Behind Idolatry for Divinity. And I should probably clarify what this means. See, idolatry is finding meaning, finding the, the meaning of yourself in the things of, the, in, in creation and not the creator. So when we worship and we worship creation, we are being idolatrous and we're in idolatry. But, if you are worshiping God and you are finding your identity in God, if you're finding your meaning and your purpose and reflecting who God is, then you are looking at the face of God. You're accepting God's divinity. See, Paul says in Romans 1 that we are to exchange, that when we exchange the glory of God for creation, we, we exchange his glory. But we we need to exchange. But now today, we need to exchange the the idolatrous world, the world that has corrupted us and told us what we should be. We now have to leave those behind and exchange idolatry for divinity. We have to leave behind idolatry to point to God and find who we are really meant to be in order to fully represent it. See, as a human, you are an image of God. And as Christians, we believe that God knows what is best for us and that God can fully define who we are. So we don't just as Christians believe in a future hope, but we believe that there is an, a present reality to our salvation and a present benefit to who we are being as Christians. And that is that we are human, we are images of God. And in order to be an image of God, we have to reflect him. And if we don't reflect him, well, we reflect the world, we reflect creation, a, d a distorted creation, a corrupt creation. So you are most human when you are most like God. We have to leave behind idolatry for divinity. We have to leave behind worshiping the things of this world to worship the creator so that we can know God, so that we can properly reflect him. Because if we don't know who he is, well, then he's just got a nice smile. But if we know who God is, then we can reflect who he is because we know him and we know what, who he is. You are most alive. You are the, the most you, the best you, when you are living in relationship and worshiping your creator. Uh, I would like to now introduce to you my hypothetical best friend, and a better human, uh, Josh Greger.